at the BRC. Uh, I was privileged to get to go there in 2000. Uh, it is a unique place where it's not just this uh, basic research facility, but has process development, about 150 engineers and process engineers. Pilot plant scale manufacturing site, a clinic, and a GLP laboratory to analyze clinical samples. And over the years, even though we were focused and uh, founded in order to make an HIV vaccine, uh, if that hasn't been successful yet, it allowed us to explore a lot of new vaccine modalities from nucleic acids to monoclonal antibody discovery and protein based approaches that have uh, been applied to a number of other unmet needs, including emerging infectious diseases. And we've shared these products around the world. And it's been done by, by this relatively small group of uh, principal investigators and uh, program heads. We face this ongoing parade of emerging infectious diseases. And we also need uh, better vaccines for some of our licensed products and vaccines for unmet needs. And we've learned over these last few years that public health approaches, traditional public health approaches are effective, but somewhat limited in scope. And yet, uh, even in the last 20 years, uh, just during this century, we've faced uh, all of these new viral threats that have come through. And the VRC uh, responded to virtually all of these in, in one way or the other. We also have a number of unmet needs that uh, top of the list is HIV and hepatitis C, but also we need generalizable approaches for vaccines against these other viral families that really haven't been solved yet. And we need to improve these vaccines uh, for influenza, mumps, yellow fever, and filoviruses. And uh, I'm only going to talk about viruses today, but we obviously also still need malaria, TB, and a lot of other vaccines for untreatable or virulent bacteria, fungi, and parasites. So there's still a lot of work for you to do. And one of the main messages is, since all of you are very young, uh, you have at least 30 years to go, and you should all pick a vaccine and figure out how to make it because that's usually how long it takes. Fortunately, we're in this era where uh, we have all these new technologies that I could not have envisioned 30 years ago, literally could not have even imagined what we could now do. Uh, the chief among those I count as structural biology and protein engineering, but Single cell sorting, single cell analysis, all the high throughput and uh, ability for chemical synthesis of nucleic acids, uh, all these things have created this new world of vaccinology, and it's made it more of an engineering approach than this iterative empirical approach that we used to always take. It shouldn't be surprising that these new technologies should lead to a new cluster of vaccines because that's the way it's always worked. When Jenner discovered a smallpox vaccine uh, almost by accident and, and then Pasteur developed uh, the rabies vaccine really by his uh, observational skills and, and just will, before we even knew what immunology was or what a virus was, uh, these two uh, vaccines were made, and they were made in the hides or spinal cords of animals. And uh, when, Jan when uh, Good Pasture learned how to grow viruses in eggs, it allowed the yellow fever and influenza vaccines to be made. When Enders et al. invented cell culture and learned how to grow virus to high titer, it allowed this cluster of whole inactivated or attenuated viruses to be viral vaccines to be made. And then Molecular biology opened up things like the recombinant proteins or reassorted viruses, um, virus-like particles, and now even molecular clones. And so every time a new set of technologies emerged, we got a new set of vaccines. And we thought that uh, we, we can put the VSV, Ebola vaccine, in the molecular biology category, but I also put it in this new era that I'll describe 
which we thought would be led by respiratory syncytial virus, which we thought might be the first example of a structure-based vaccine design. But coronavirus came in ahead of that and basically used all of these technologies. In the global response to coronavirus, all of these things were uh, used, and it really did launch this new era of vaccinology. Some of these techniques are improve the precision of either antigen design or antigen display or the analysis of responses at a single cell level. It allows us to rapidly identify new human monoclonal antibodies. And uh, the other set are really t- to help go faster and, and, and to do it in a higher, through, a higher throughput, but also a higher scale. And these are the things we need for pandemic preparedness against all these viruses that are coming at us. Um, the precision and uh, the kind of detailed knowledge you need of viruses to be prepared, and then the, all the methodologies and platform uh, manufacturing approaches you need to rapidly respond. So we should be in a better place for really being prepared for pandemics. And uh, the question is, are we? really there yet. And the VRC was always trying to go faster in our efforts to make an HIV vaccine. And uh, we used DNA technology, uh, nucleic acid vaccine based on DNA, in many cases along the way. Uh, The first example in 2003 was the first SARS, where it took 20 months from sequence to first in phase one. And it went down to about 11 months in 2006 with uh, avian influenza, and then four months with swine flu in 2009, and we got it down to about 100 days in 2016 with Zika, but it really still wasn't fast enough when we thought we had to get it down to at least uh, 50 days to to really uh, get a result. Because what happens is if you don't get a result during the pandemic, during the outbreak, then you really are uh, are unable to get a license uh, application. And if you don't get that, then pharmaceutical companies are not going to be interested in development. And in order to get uh, things done fast enough to meet the outbreak, uh, it really is a, a challenge. And in this case, in 2014, we had a, a chimpanzee-derived ad vector for Ebola on the shelf, already approved for phase one testing, that we uh, started uh in around May of 2014 when this outbreak uh, started. And we were able to get a a phase three trial started in Liberia within about a year. But Liberia is on this red line of the outbreak. And by then it was almost uh, gone and we did not get an efficacy result from that adenovirus vectored uh, vaccine. Guinea, uh, where they were doing ring vaccination with VSV Ebola, uh, vaccine uh, smoldered on a bit more, and fortunately, uh, there was uh, a result that was obtained for VSV Ebola. So we do at least have one licensed Ebola vaccine. 2016, when we made the D- DNA for Zika within about 100 days, this was a DNA that expressed a subviral particle. So it was a particle-based vaccine made by the DNA, and it was... I think uh, effective enough to work. It wasn't as good as it could have been, but we didn't get it into the field in Central and South America in a phase 2B efficacy trial for about 16 months. And again, the outbreak was almost over. So we have to go faster. And during this Zika outbreak, while we were making the DNA, we were also testing things in the monkey models we had for other uh, manufacturers, including Moderna. Moderna made an mRNA vaccine that expressed the same basic subviral particle that we did, and we found that in the monkey system, 30 micrograms of the, their RNA was as good as 4 milligrams of our DNA. And so we started making the switch because uh, if we really want to get ahead of all these viruses, these are the ones described in the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century, and it's still happening. This Woolhouse just did an observational study. Anybody could have done this. He just simply counted the viruses that showed up in the 20th century. 
And what he realized was that even though the number of virus infections in humans kept going up in a linear fashion, the number of viral families started plateauing. And when I saw this, I thought that meant that this, it was, it was really feasible to really get your head around all the different viral families and, and try to be better prepared for, for these pandemic threats. And so we published this paper in 2018 after a few years of thinking about what, what this would mean. And the idea would be to take the 26 viral families that infect humans, identify prototypes within those families, and then uh, make vaccines and all the reagents and other uh, products, antivirals and other things you would need to address the prototype and hopefully find generalizable approaches that could address these other uh, viruses within those viral families. And uh, it's a long list, and it would be a lot of work. It's probably, I usually say it's like 20 years of work for a 1,000 good scientists, but it's doable, and it, we have the technologies now to, to really do this. And so... Uh, we organize these into entry mechanisms. So in each quadrant, um, there are viruses that either use class one fusion proteins, class two, class three, or non-envelope viruses. And the idea would be to have uh, organized, coordinated, uh, pathogen-specific experts working on these different virus families, but also working within entry mechanisms to see if you could learn not just within a family, but across families. And then supported by all these development techniques that would be in centers uh, distributed around the world that could then turn the experimental uh, concepts into real products. And uh, if you did that for these 30 or so prototypes, prototype uh, viruses uh, and at least develop products through phase one and the reagents and other things you'd need to do the the non-prototype uh, things that showed up and then had um, at least product development through animal testing for the other 90 or so viruses on that list, you would be uh, much better prepared. And we thought this was possible because, in part because of our work on respiratory syncytial virus, uh, in 2008, Jason McClellan, is, who's a fellow in Peter Kwong's lab at the time at the BRC, wanted to work on something besides HIV. And I said, well, of course, you should work on respiratory syncytial virus, which I'd spent most of my career on. And after a few years, we were finally able to solve the structure of the prefusion form of the F protein shown here with a FAB of an antibody holding it together on the top. And what you see here is that the prefusion form is drastically different in shape and surfaces than the postfusion form, even though some of those surfaces are shared, like that little loop is what we call the site for uh, uh, antigenic site. It's preserved on both. So for many years, people thought that that postfusion F protein should be sufficient to make a vaccine for RSV. And there were five phase three efficacy trials that all had the same result, which was uh, they were safe, uh, but they didn't boost neutralizing activity very much. So since we have these new structures now, you can also then map all the epitopes and antigenic sites on F, which is a very uh, metastable protein. And this protein flips into the post-fusion form, even on normal viruses. And what you see is that you have the antigenic sites, the yellow is the site two that palavizumab is directed against. This is one of our licensed products for RSV since the late 90s and site four. But these other, the red one, which we call site zero and the orange one, uh, they don't exist on this post-fusion uh, molecule. And these are the ones to which the most potent neutralizing antibodies are directed. So discovering that new structure, which was really a basic research project, uh, revealed this site of vulnerability at the apex that we call site zero that doesn't exist on the post-fusion, and that has been used many times and always with this result of boosting neutralizing activity two to four-fold. But if you then uh, 
add the trimerization domain to hold it together at the C-terminus and, and put some in, internal disulfide and cavity filling mutations, you can hold it in that shape, and now you can boost neutralizing activity 10 to 20-fold. And just to show you how these class 1 fusion proteins work, I hope you can see the bottom uh, little movie, but the virus uh, has the F on it. It unravels at the top, inserts the fusion peptide into the host cell, and then the heptad repeats form and pull everything together, creating a fusion pore, and that's what allows the viral nucleocapsid to get into the cell and start the replication process. So if you can prevent that rearrangement of the protein, you can block virus infection. And and uh, if you attack that post-fusion form, the one that's non-functional and already used up, it's not going to work as well as attacking this pre-fusion functional form of the, of the protein. And so that indeed was the case. And if you now take some of these new technology, the other new technologies I was mentioning, where you can look at individual single cells and the response to a vaccine, now we're going to look at the B cell response to this uh, vaccine. This is the vaccine that we made at the VRC, the pre-fusion. And you can use these, either the pre-fusion or the post-fusion now as a probe in flow cytometry and ask, what do the B cells see when uh, when you vaccinated? And so this, these are the B cells starting out before vaccination and with a pre-fusion vaccination, with the pre-fusion probe on the Y-axis, you see a lot of pre-fusion exclusive B cells in that upper left quadrant but also some of the dual binding cells that bind both pre and post fusion in the upper right quadrant. In the metamune, uh, they were, uh, that's now AstraZeneca, they were generous enough to share some of their PBM samples with us that they had uh, derived from their last trial of this post fusion F molecule. If you boost with the post fusion molecule, what you get is a lot of the dual binding uh, antibodies, which is in the upper right quadrant and some post-fusion specific that are binding this six helix bundle that's part of the used up molecule. But if you boost these pre-fusion specific uh, B cells, you're now accessing, these are hundreds of monoclonal antibodies that were derived from young children and adults that are about 100 to 10 to 100 times more potent on average per molecule if it's pre-fusion exclusive antibodies, then the dual binding antibodies uh, that come from, that, that can bind both the pre and the post-fusion. So this is the reason this pre-fusion molecule is a more effective vaccine antigen. And I threw this in, I know this is a lot to look at, but just uh, bear with me just a minute, because this is some of the power of these new technologies. And this is similar to a flow plot. It's got the pre-fusion and the post-fusion on the Y and X axis, but these are actually uh, uh, yeast display or phase display. It's yeast display of antibodies that were derived from uh, infected or vaccinated people. And each of those little strips, uh, we never really knew what those were until recently, but Either in the flow cytometry, which you saw over here, you see these little clouds of B cells. And these clouds of uh, antibody uh, expressing yeast uh, make the same kind of clouds. And it turns out that if you use monoclonal antibodies to map these, each one of those clouds represents the B cell response to a specific antigenic site. So now with flow cytometry, using these kind of uh, atomic level design probes, you can uh, follow whether you're making B cells to the site zero, site five, three, et cetera, all the way down the line. And now you can even follow them over time and, and have antigen specific uh phenotyping on your B cell response to a vaccine, which starts changing what you can ask about how vaccines work and how you can make vaccines better and how you can make them more durable. So this technology is changing everything. And since class one fusion proteins are on many of the envelope viruses that we care about, like paramyxoviruses or 
uh, influenza, HIV, Lassa, or Ebola are all class one fusion protein viruses, and coronaviruses are class one fusion protein viruses. And can we learn across viral families? So when Jason McClellan moved to Dartmouth in 2013 to start his own lab, we wanted to extend the findings on RSV, and we decided to work on coronaviruses because there were no structures at that time for coronaviruses. And and Jason needed something that was not competing with uh, all the HIV work that was still going on in structural biology. And these class one fusion proteins all work about the same way because they all have this underlying fusion machinery that does that membrane fusion. And some of them have capping domains like these. Coronavirus has a capping domain and also has this intervening piece that has to be cut out with, with two cleavage sites, but they all work about the same way. So you can learn across these. And the question is, if you stabilize class one fusion proteins, does it make them better uh, vaccine antigens? And so because of the work we've done with Moderna in 2016 on mRNA and our thinking about pandemic preparedness, we wanted to do a demonstration project on the paramyxoviruses and the coronaviruses using either NEPA for paramyxos or the MERS coronavirus for the coronaviridae family and made a deal with Moderna that they would make the RNA, we would design the antigens, and we would see how far we could get in this demonstration project. So we wanted to find generalizable approaches for each of these viral families. For paramyxoviruses, you don't know for sure if it's going to be this attachment protein. In the case of NEPA, it would be called the G protein or the F protein that's mediated in fusion. Uh, or, and so in some cases, the, the attachment protein, the G protein, would be a better antigenic target. In some cases, the F protein would be better. And so we designed a molecule that had the prefusion form of F connected to three monomers of the attachment protein on the other end. So it has both the attachment and the fusion proteins. We have shown that the prefusion form of these F proteins is, are also more immunogenic than, than the, the native pro- project, uh, native protein. We finally got the a spike structure in 2016, which allowed us to uh, then do some of the protein engineering. And in this case, we found that a two-proline substitution at the top of the central helix not only preserved these apical epitopes that uh, are neutralization sensitive, but it also uh, significantly increased the uh, amount of protein that was expressed from a transduced cell. So the MERS wild type versus that simple two-proline substitution to stabilize, that increased protein production by 50-fold. So if you're giving a gene-based delivery of an mRNA or a vector-based approach, you'd like it to be making 50 times more pro- times more protein of your vaccine antigen than than not. So both for preservation of epitopes and for protein expression, the stabilization is helpful. And so uh, the mRNA was helpful, not only because I told you it was more potent, but it really does have authentic antigen presentation, especially when you're talking about RNA viruses. And it induces both uh, antibody and CD8 T cell responses, unlike a protein. A protein was really only induce antibody responses. It induces a Th1 biased response, which we learned from RSV was important for safety purposes. And unlike DNA, which has to go all the way into the nucleus to be effective, and most DNA gets trapped in the cytoplasm, RNA only has to go into the cytoplasm uh, to be translated uh, directly into the protein. And within hours, uh, the lipid nanoparticle and the RNA are degraded. All you're left with is this protein, uh, in the case of coronavirus, the spike protein stuck in the membrane. And and so uh, it's a very simple, It's to me, it's the most elemental way of making a vaccine antigen that you can uh, imagine. It has no anti-vector immunity like some of the pox or adeno vectors would have. And importantly, it's uh, made by chemical synthesis. So that now simplifies the process. It makes it much simpler. Even It's not simple, but it's simpler than 
a whole having a whole campus full of bioreactors to make uh, protein based vaccines or vector or virus based vaccines. So we had been working on this prototype approach. We tested the RNA and then uh, in 2017, we made the deal with Moderna. Dr. Fauci gave us a little more money to do the NEPA work. We'd already been doing the coronavirus work. And in 2019, we did reciprocal site visits and pulled the trigger and said, we're going to do a NEPA mRNA study in the first quarter of 2020. And we were all ready to go and all the agreements were in place. Everything was ready to go. And then, of course, we had uh, this event at the end of December. In December 31st, we heard about this new virus breaking out in China, in Wuhan, China. And it's a virus everybody knows now, SARS-CoV-2, and uh, it infects the the airways, ciliated cells in the lower airways. This is the virus trapped in mucus on ciliated bronchiolar epithelial cells, and you see the virus here enlarged. And if you enlarge it further, you see that it's about an 80 nanometer diameter spherical object with a lot of knobs on the surface, and these knobs are all the spike protein. So it it becomes pretty obvious why spike protein might be the best uh, target for, um, for your vaccine. And then we were faced with this historical information that it usually has taken decades or not even possible to make a vaccine, to really develop a vaccine from the time a virus was discovered to the time uh, the virus was available for use was always measured in decades. But uh, because of these new technologies, in part, the world responded. And in the WHO landscape analysis, you can find over 350 different vaccine development programs around the world. And virtually every one of these modalities has been made and tested for uh, coronavirus uh, immunity. And over 150 of them have gotten into clinical trials. And so we now have this huge new database, uh, unprecedented uh, of all these uh, new modalities, new adjuvants, uh, largely all focused on the same antigen. So we not only have this rich uh, immunology database, but we have a lot of uh, precedent-setting safety data for, for new vaccines. So when we found out that this was probably a beta coronavirus on the 6th of January, we waited uh, patiently until the 10th when the sequence was released, and then we were able to design the plasmids needed to make spike protein to solve the structures and start assays and immunize mice. Moderna got us back the mRNA within 24 days because we knew that those two proline substitutions uh, not only stabilized uh, the HKU1 virus, which we had worked on to get that structure, but it then stabilized MERS and the first SARS and about a dozen other coronaviruses that, and it worked every time. And so we uh, designed the spike sequence with those two prolines at 986 and 987 without any additional experimentation and went right in to production because we already had a relationship uh, with Moderna. And, and then by 65 days, we were in phase one. By six and a half months, we were in phase three. And this was really only possible because we had done this prior work on the structure and mapping antigenic sites and studying neutralizing uh, mechanisms. And and so this was really all uh, led by uh, basic research activities. The other great thing about these technologies is the same exact uh, reagents used to make the vaccine and help design the vaccine uh, were used to discover some of the early monoclonal antibodies that were used for therapeutically. So when we got the first um, convalescent PBMCs from Janet England, I don't know if Janet's here today, from her colleague, Helen Chu, uh, and had our probes made, we were able to send them to our collaborator, Abcellera. They sent us back hundreds of antibody sequences within a couple of weeks, and we made those antibodies, tested them, and the most immunizing one initially was our 555 antibody, and Lily turned that into bamlanivimab, and then our 1404 antibody became bevtilovimab, 
So the same process, the same kind of ideas, the same reagents, not only led to the vaccine, uh, but also uh, made some of these therapeutic monoclonal antibodies available. And so the VRC was in this very unique position, and it was really just because of, of the type of multidisciplinary center it was, the fact that we'd responded to several public health emergencies of international concern and sort of had a system set up to do that. We knew something about how to keep vaccine uh, immunization for for new diseases safe. We had experience with structure-based design and antibody discovery and uh, platform manufacturing ideas and thinking about prototype uh, pathogen uh, preparedness, but more importantly, this public-private partnership and all of our academic partnerships already in place allowed this uh, to just go right into uh, the process of development. And so many people have been hesitant to take vaccines because they said it was too fast. It's never gone that fast before. And they were nervous that corners had been cut. But Really, for this vaccine, I think we've had more data, uh, better data, than we've ever had for any other vaccine in history. And you can tell it as a one-year story or as a three-year story of pandemic preparedness or an eight-year story of antigen design and structure-based vaccine concepts or a 15- or 20-year or We think of it as a 40-year story because almost all of these technologies have been driven by efforts to make an HIV vaccine, even though we still don't have an HIV vaccine. And hopefully, uh, at some point, we can turn all these things back on HIV. RSV is an example of structure, you know, avoidance, conformational avoidance of uh, immune responses. That can be turned back on HIV. We can get better influenza vaccines and overcome immunodominance and some of the antigenic variability that can be turned back on HIV. So we're not finished with HIV, but it is still a, a long way away. And then uh, now we have mRNA, which is a completely new vaccine modality, and it's going to change a lot of things, and it's going to be brought up in every vaccine meeting you're in from now on. And it is a great new technology, and and some of the uh, innovations like that Drew Weissman and Caitlin Carrico found that modifying some of the nucleotides, instead of using uridine, you use a one methyl pseudouridine, and that changes the way the uh, RNA induces some of these uh, signaling mechanisms in the cell that creates a lot of interferon, uh, type 1 interferons that then shut down protein uh, production. So... There's a lot of uh, good properties in the current RNA that's already been developed, and it does create these uh, authentic responses. We now know it's safe and efficacious in hundreds of millions of people. The supply chain and stability issues are improving. I think eventually this will be lyophilized for room temperature storage, maybe on microneedles. Importantly, uh, because it can be a small footprint, small batch type manufacturing that could be done in modular containment units, I think it is well suited for low and middle income country use, uh, not only for uh, research, but for uh, eventually for manufacturing. There's a lot of room for improvement that's needed in the RNA and in not uh, in the design and the codon modification algorithms and the lipid composition. And so all of that is going to be going forward the next few years. But people should remember that RNA is not magic. And if you don't deliver the right protein, it probably won't work. So now that we have these coronavirus vaccines, uh, this is uh, uh, estimations uh, made by either the Commonwealth Fund or the Imperial College groups that suggested that in and uh, through two years, uh, three million deaths in the U.S. may have been averted and a lot of hospitalizations and a lot of money saved by having the vaccines. And in just one year, uh, Imperial College estimated, if you look at ba- deaths based on excess mortality, that maybe as many as 
19 million lives were saved uh, in the world. But the question is, uh, where were those lives saved? And where were the deaths averted? And if you look at now uh, distributed by income, uh, most of the averted deaths were in high and middle income countries. And relatively few uh, deaths were in of averted in low income countries. So there's still a lot of work to do. And even by the end of, uh, even now, this is current data, relatively current data. Africa is very under vaccinated. And by the end of 2021, um, when many places had uh, access to vaccines, less than half of the African continent was immunized by the end of 2021. So the question is, viruses don't respect borders. It's uh, these. This this has to be a global effort going forward if we're going to really be on top of pandemic preparedness and having areas of the world that are under vaccinated uh, creates risks for everyone, because that's where variants come from. That's where the successive waves of new variants are going to come from. So if we can't learn how to vaccinate the whole world in six months instead of six years, then we won't fare very well against future pandemic threats. I want to go back to RSV just briefly. Uh, I know I'm probably running out of time, Edwin. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, this is, I'm, on, I'm almost through. This is my next last slide. So um, RSV now after 10 years, all of a sudden now we have a number of new products uh, that are coming due. And now we have at least one approved vaccine, uh, the GSK for the elderly, based on this prefusion molecule uh, adjuvant, this similar to the one they use in Shingrix, only half the dose. And so that was approved in the U.S. In, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, this antibody that can be given directly to infants uh, was approved by EMA. And it's all of these are under review by the FDA now, the U.S. And so there'll be RSV vaccines for the elderly, for maternal immunization, and antibodies for treatment directly of infants and Still, we don't have things for the five to 60 month old infant who still are going to have severe RSV, but RSV is now uh, coming along. And so the question is, as all these new technologies are more widely available, how are we going to really uh, achieve equity in distribution and uh, of, of these products that are life saving and, and can't just be focused on um, on high-income countries, and and how are we going to achieve the cooperation and coordination that's needed to really get on top of this? Because we don't want the RSV vaccines uh, being delayed into low- and middle-income countries like like many products often are. We need to do better. So we're in this new era of vaccinology. I think it's going to be based on precision of design and uh, speed of manufacturing, platform manufacturing. It's critical to keep investing in basic research. This is what created all these opportunities that we've had to, to try to solve the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, the breakthroughs in immunology uh, are needed for HIV and hepatitis C and for better influenza vaccines. We still need a lot of work on mRNA. But importantly, uh, as we go forward, we need to solve problems of access and of uptake. So a lot of people also had access to vaccines and decided not to take them. So I want to thank my lab that I left, uh, especially Dr. Corbett, because Mikia Corbett is pictured here. She was a research fellow in my lab and was very important during those first eight weeks, especially of 2020, to get uh, those vaccines launched into phase two, all the VRCPIs, and um, Jason McClellan, who's been my long-term collaborator on structure-based design. And this is the small team in my lab that Dr. Corbett was working with uh, during those first eight weeks, getting that first uh, vaccine into phase one testing. And all the other academic and government and industry collaborators, thank you. Thank you, Diane.
I think we're going to have uh, time for a few questions, but yes, let's start. Thanks for a great talk. This is Renske from Norway. Um, so for epidemic and pandemic preparedness, the mRNA platform has obviously many advantages. Do you think we should all focus now on optimizing the mRNA platform, or do you still see a role for viral vectors, proteins, other platforms? I think vaccines have to be fit for purpose, and I don't think mRNA is going to solve all problems. I, I think it's likely that for boosting, that proteins may end up still being a better thing to boost when you have a lot of pre-existing immunity. mRNA can boost, but it boosts less well each time successively you give it. And so, you know, mRNA is going to solve a lot of problems. I think it's going to be really good for priming. It's not going to be easy to prime the mucosa, and it's not necessarily going to be easy to boost systemically with RNA. So we need proteins. We need display designs that can overcome this problem of immunodominance. That's why I think the nanoparticle display technologies that are coming along are going to be so important so you can have a mosaic display of multiple antigens that might help uh, select things that are more likely, select antibodies that are more likely to bind two things at once. It gives them a, a vitty advantage and try to overcome some of that immunodominance. So I think uh, mRNA is going to solve some things. I think it's really important technology for pandemic response. If you can match the antigen to the pathogen and rapidly make it and dis de deploy it, then that's where its greatest advantage will be, I think. Also for research, so um, in low- and middle-income countries, um, I think it makes more sense to make this kind of technology available to regional investigators so they can solve regional problems. I, I met Esther from Kenya today. I mean, Kenya should be solving Rift Valley fever, and Nigerians should be solving Lhasa. And, uh, Maybe Ugandans could solve the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever problems. I, there, we need to get this kind of technology because it's a very rapid iterative design cycle type of thing. And if this was in the hands of regional investigators, they would solve some of these regional problems before they become global problems. Matt. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, is there, um, could you could you apply this to safety? Is there an element of um, pre precision antigen targeting that sort of gives us um, anticipated safety issues, or are the safety issues sort of so unpredictable that it's not it, it doesn't help us anticipate? Uh, and we could have an example whether it's Guillain-Barre or molecular mimicry or something. Is there an element there? Well. Um... In my mind, I spent the first 20 years of my life working out the basis for the vaccine-enhanced disease that happened with RSV back in the 60s. So vaccine safety is everything. And to me, the best way to achieve safety is to keep everything as simple as possible. And so if you can have just the one major target designed at an atomic level precision that you want the immune system to see and, and not be seeing a lot of off-target type of epitopes from scrambled proteins or peptides, then that makes it safer. And having mRNA, for instance, because everything is degraded within hours after you deliver the nanoparticle and single strand of RNA, those are that is the simplest vaccine I think that we've ever had. And so I think as we get things simpler and simpler, uh, the side effects, um, there will always be side effects as you're trying to create immunity. But, you know, I think they'll be less than they are for for infections, for sure. I mean, they're way less than being infected. And I think they'll be minimal uh, for for vaccination. So I'm Liana from India. My question is about the uh, HFMD vaccines. If you have anything on, because we have uh, circulating strains of CVA 6, 16 and 6 across different parts of India. Small, it's occurring as small outbreaks. So any update on HFMD vaccines? And also another question is, is tomato flu different from HFMD or is it the same? Um, what was the last part of your question? 
uh, this, the, uh, the second one was about tomato flu. There was an outbreak of a tomato flu, which we ruled out to be not dengue, chikungunya, zika, herpes. So it's similar. And it was a publication in Lancet. It's come from Kerala, a southern state of India, where I'm from, where Nipah outbreaks and these viral outbreaks happen. So it's tomato flu because there are literature showing that, stating that tomato flu is same as HFMD. And then there is also literature showing they are different. So I'm kind of lost HSMB. Hand, foot, and mouth disease. Hand, foot, and mouth disease. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, well, almost all of my work so far has been on envelope viruses, but there's a lot of work to do on non, non-envelope viruses. As, and the hand, foot, and mouth uh, disease um, is a picornavirus. And it's similar to the EBD-68 that, uh, you know, we've had problems with acute flaccid myelitis here. I think there may be generalizable approaches for that. Uh, actually, just yesterday it did come out, our, a paper on making a virus-like particle for EBD-68 uh, as a vaccine strategy, as a protein. It can also be launched as an mRNA. And so uh, I think between using some of the new protein engineering approaches to solve some of the, all the antigenic variation that occurs in, in those picornaviruses or making uh, mosaics of the particles that you can create now uh, in vitro, that uh, there may be ways to solve uh, these non-envelope viruses like, like uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease and which is mostly EVD seventy EV seventy one and and so yeah I think the coronaviruses and and I think that new technology could also help in uh, things like polio which I think we're going to hear about next. Last question, Santosh. Thank you, I'm Santosh from the WHO. What's the role of the mRNA technology? more in an endemic disease that we are striving for that's targeting towards global elimination and eradication. So for measles and things like that, do you think we'll ever be able to eradicate RSV? It doesn't have an animal uh, host. Anyway, I think mRNA, um, like I said, I think RNA is going to be really good for initial priming for things that we haven't really seen before. So priming babies for uh, respiratory diseases and things like that, RNA is going to work. Whether RNA is really uh, the right modality to to turn the response, for instance, that's pre-existing in influenza where we've all either been infected or vaccinated dozens of times, can, can RNA really be delivered in a way that can turn the repertoire to expand it to, to more breadth and cover more species. I, I don't think we know that yet. That, that is ongoing work. And Moderna is doing a lot of different things with influenza and a lot of other viral diseases using RNA. So I think we're going to learn all, a lot of that in the next five years. But right now, um, I think we have to wait for more data to see if RNA is going to solve those kinds of problems where you're trying to um, turn the ship and get a new repertoire established for in, in a pre-existing immunity.